Now, final mini lecture for chapter one, section 1.5, evolutionary foundations. So when you go and you look at us living things, nothing's set in stone. Hell, look at the Grand Canyon. Even stone changes. It just takes time. Well, when you go and you look at us living things, everything starts at the genes, the genotype, the genetic level, what's in the DNA. DNA, barring any you know, environmental major outbreak, outcome of something, the DNA controls the phenotype. Okay, you look here, the hexokinase, illustrating the central dogma. Transcription, translation, post-translational modification, you know, mature enzyme. That hexokinase will always be hexokinase, as long as there's no change in the gene. Slight change at the genetic level. What should have been AAGTAA now becomes AAGGAA. How big of a change was that? Don't know. That change of T to a G, that's a mutation. So when you hear people talk about mutations, 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 and they show these big grotesque things, especially in movies, now, a mutation is just a change in the genetic sequence. Most mutations that are going to occur to you, you will never know. Every time you eat, you drink, you breathe in, there is the potentiality for some form of chemical or compound present there to get into your cells and alter the genes. Go through and change the G to the T, or make some large scale, you know, bunch of nucleotides get changed. That's a mutation. For the most part, we have, you know, um, enzymes that will recognize, quote unquote, recognize differences, go through and change them back, fix the rep and repair any of the damage. But, yeah. No, a lot of times it just, you know, if it happens in a skin cell, oh, well, no big deal. You'll slough off those skin cells at some point in time. They die, become keratinized outer epidermis. They get sloughed off. No big deal. Happens in, you know, testes and ovaries. May happen to a sperm or an egg. Yeah, well, now you're looking at something you could pass on. That might, you know, affect the species. As you sit there listening to this, and as you'll be sitting there in lecture, we all are humans. We all have the same genes located in the same places on the same chromosomes, all of that loci the same. But no two of us are genetically identical. No two of us are, you know, identical twins. So we have the same genes, but the sequence is going to be slightly different. So, some mutations, good. Some mutation, bad. Now, result if the mutation is such that there's no major differences, and we see that throughout the population, it's considered wild type. When the mutations come in and they alter the protein, the final protein, or they alter the final phenotype, that's a mutation we will go through and we will look at. Now it comes down, how do these biomolecules, all these molecules, where did they come from? Okay, if we look at it from a scientific standpoint, okay, we need an experiment. Well, we usually go back to the Miller-Urey experiment. This closed system where they put in a bunch of what they thought were the primordial gases, methane, um, what is it? 
NH3, CH4, H2, water, hydrogen sulfide, you know, H2S. Put those in there, heated it up, kept it going. You'll notice down here at the bottom, you know, that flask, water, above it in the low, upper one chamber, gases. So you'll get water heated, vapor, condensation, water heated, vapor, and it kind of cycles through. And then they used electrodes, give spark of energy. Because remember, you're going to have that activation energy for any chemical reaction to occur. And changing those gases into chemical compounds, that's going to be definitely endorgonic. So the electrodes, shock of energy. You know, we still think that the early Earth, while it's covered in water, the uh, atmosphere is very violent, very electrified, a lot going on there, lots of thunderstorms. So there's the electrodes, shock, shock, shock. Were they able to make amino acids? Oh, good Lord, no. Okay, the time scale would be big T time for this to happen. Millions of years. They only let this run for a few days, a few weeks, at best. What they got, though, were building blocks. They no longer had the ammonia, they no longer had the methane, the hydrogen sulfide. What they did end up with are the building blocks to make amino acids. That's pretty big. Our now, our way of thinking is it wasn't DNA. It wasn't DNA first and later RNA because DNA, deoxyribo, and our whole, you know, twisted up molecule is basically it's too advanced. You can't make this big leap forward, something so advanced, and then backtrack to utilize something that is so not RNA is a single strand okay single strand of nucleic acids now that single strand of nucleic acids can fold back in on itself and make some structures but it's not going to form that twisted chiral that we see with DNA Early RNA is going to be short strands, maybe a few hundred nucleotides in length that are going to fold back in on itself, forming hairpins. So instead of one straight line that's two-dimensional, by folding back on itself in certain ways, the nucleotides hydrogen bonding with other nucleotides in the same strand, you go from a two-dimensional object to a three-dimensional object. Three-dimensional object now is shape. Shape dictates function. You now have... RNA molecules that can act as enzymes. We see these nowadays, ribozymes. Your ribosome is a ribozyme of sorts. So these RNA molecules can go and start doing things, making copies of cells, stuff like that, can act as the catalyst to drive certain reactions. So we're starting to think that early Earth, the first quote-unquote living things, were cells based around RNA. The first reactions were based on RNA and ribozymes. It's not a true cell, but it's a collection of ribozyme-based reactions. Some peptide there to aid in maintaining of the structure, acting as substrate and product. But you fast forward millions of years, the RNA is still too unstable. DNA, because that double helix, that chiral structure, very stable, can handle changes in temperature. RNA can't. RNA breaks down very easily. So you start to see there would be 
a progression from RNA, which is very simplistic, RNA to RNA peptides. RNA peptides are now DNA. I make it sound simple, but you got to remember, this is probably going to take millions, hundreds of millions of years to occur. Start to see lipid vesicles surrounding RNA. RNA that's acting as ribozymes, even if it has a little bit of peptides with it, associated with it. RNA only can do so much. RNA with some peptides helping to brace the, thir the three dimensional structure out competes, does more. Boom, boom, boom. Metabolically, you know, you get different enzymes, different ribozymes, different things occurring. That's free floating, doesn't do much. But those things that get, you know, those ribozymes and the substrates and products get caught up in a lipid bubble, just a bubble. Well, now they occur and they occur a little bit better because things aren't drifting off, things aren't diffusing away. They're contained in with a bubble. Hmm. Early plasma membrane material metabolism substrates being turned into product those product which is now driving the acquisition of new substrate we now have life and it becomes this evolutionary arms race those lipid bubbles that have these enzymes going on are now braced now have more going on A little bit better, you know, you fast forward millions of years, those lipid bubbles that are now have proteins and phospholipids and things attached to the phospholipids can now take in more, do more, outcompete these simplified things, and now have what we would think of as true living cells. That's evolution. If something does just a little bit better and that continues on over time, I don't mean time like a few hours, few days, I'm talking time as in millennia, thousands of years, thousands of years start to, you know, accumulate and you're now talking eons, millions of years. That's evolution. And you go and you look here. You know, and you can see as this slow progression of things occurring. RNA, RNA peptides, ribozymes, RNA peptides, now using, you know, rudimentary DNA. Those DNA now become chromosomes, single chromosome, which over hundreds of millions of years now become multiple chromosomes contained in a small lipid envelope within a bigger cell and so on and so forth. This is what drives evolution. Small little changes over time that accumulate and allow an organism, not a singular, I say organism, the big O organism, that population, that species to do just a little bit better than everybody else. Initially, we think a lot of the metabolism in these early cells were driven by the energy of thermal vents because there's a lot of heat there a lot of stuff going on you know but as life spread from those thermal vents at the bottom of the ocean started to spread out new areas one of those areas happens to be shallow waters, tide pools, or at the edges of, where they can get direct sunlight, and there was a lot of sunlight. Most cells couldn't do much with it. Some cells mutated over time and slowly began to accumulate photosynth uh, pigments. A lot of those pigments didn't do anything. Some of those pigments started to vibrate when the sunlight, the photons of energy, hit them. 
fast forward millions of years, those excited pigments started to give off excited electrons, which enzymes would then be able to use through a series of redox reactions to start to power things. And you start to see this development of what we would think of as photosynthesis. But it all started with, we think, those thermal vents, inorganic fuels, not carbon, carbon stuff, not amino acids, not lipid, not fats, using sulfur, using nitrogen containing compounds as a means to get at energy. The endosymbiotic one of those early cells that kind of struggled along. And here it's going to be one of the eukaryotic cells. Why do I throw up the air quotes? Because it's going to have a rudimentary nuclear envelope. May or may not have had some form of an ER, Golgi, don't know, don't care. But it's very rudimentary. And why do I say it's rudimentary? Because it's much bigger than the other than the prokaryotes swimming around it. Its nuclear envelope protects its DNA, so it's not going to get ravaged. You know, its DNA is protected, so it doesn't have to worry so much about mutations due to environmental factors. But the thing is, it is limited on energy, so it's rudimentary. Can't do much. Those early eukaryotic cells by themselves struggle. Those early eukaryotic cells that are in the presence of certain bacteria, archae. Well, it turns out those archae, those bacteria, other bacteria, they're doing well. They've been around millions of years, you know, half a billion years longer than those early eukaryotes. So, it's just a normal Monday for them. They overproduce certain products. Some of the products they overproduce, you know, certain peptides, certain amino acids, you know, certain organic molecules, ATP, and they just kind of shed it off. Can't use it, just get rid of it, okay? Huh. Early eukaryotic cells struggling, early eukaryotic cells growing in the presence of these bacteria can utilize their waste, their overproduced produced things, and they outperform the other. Fast forward millions of years. Instead of growing, living near each other, they're now living attached to each other. The ones that are growing in the presence of growing with them attached, you know, bound to them. Do, 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 do. do a little bit better. These still struggle. Fast forward millions of years, no longer growing in the presence of. No, the ones that are growing with them attached versus the ones where, you know what, the bacteria are now just growing inside of me. The ones that are growing inside, doing just a little bit better than the ones growing in the, pre you know, attached to which pretty much outcompeted, they're now gone, gone the way of the dodo, the ones growing in the presence of, and the ones growing by themselves. Those are dead and gone. Fast forward millions of years, those bacteria that are growing inside have now lost the ability to be outside. They're now true parts of. Well, some of those bacteria, some of those things were you know, early archaea that were going to become the mitochondria. Others are going to be, you know, some form of cyanobacteria that had pigments that are going to become what we think of nowadays as the chloroplasts. Why do we think this? Well, if you go and you look at the mitochondria and the chloroplasts, dual membranes. Hey, guess who else has dual membranes? Think back to that one lecture on the bacteria. Gram-negative bacteria, archaea, can have dual membranes. All right. Uh, turns out the mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own genome. 
that controls their own metabolisms. Just turns out that the you know mitochondria and the chloroplasts, their metabolism such as they overproduce things that they now pump out to the cell itself. The nucleus can poke and prod the mitochondria and the chloroplasts, say, hey, could you do more? Could you do this? But the mitochondria's metabolism, the chloroplast metabolism, is controlled by that organelle itself. So looking at that, no other organelle in eukaryotic cell controls itself, has its own genome for the making and repairing of itself. Yeah, the mitochondria makes more mitochondria. The cell itself doesn't make more mitochondria. In an early lecture, I mentioned the fact that if you look at cytochrome C, cytochrome C is found in you, your dog, your cat, your pet goldfish. Cytochrome C in all of us eukaryotes does the same thing. The problem is the you cytochrome C in me and the cytochrome C in a goldfish, not the same. The amino acid sequence is not the same. The, gene the DNA sequence, definitely not the same. So we refer to these as homologs. So if you read that in, you know, the scientific literature, they were talking about two genes and two different organisms, and they say they are homologs each other. They have the same role, but their shape is going to be slightly different. Different shape, slightly different function. The shape, quaternary structure based on tertiary, based on, you know, primary and secondary is going to be different because the primary is going to be different. Primary is based on the genetic sequence. So the role of cytochrome C in me, cytochrome C in that goldfish, if I remember correctly, it's something like 60 something percent the same. You know, the amino acid sequence, you know, we share six certain similarity. They're homologs. They do the same thing, but you can't swap them back and forth. And it's interesting. You go and you start looking at these homolog genes between us and a, a dog, us, a tree. We find that the majority of these homologs are going to be found in what are referred to as housekeeping genes. These are going to be genes that are there just to maintain the cell. Okay, they're always expressed. Their regulation is just that, hey, it's needed, keep making it. The differences are going to be at the extremes, the non-housekeeping genes. The ones that are going to show up only under certain circumstances. You know, they're going to be transla transcribed, translated because of this hormone kicks in or that hormone or this process needs to take place because the sun lights out or this one. And that's where you're going to find the majority of differences between us and a dog, us, a goldfish, us and a plant. <clears throat> because of the onset of sequencing in the fact that it's so much easier now than it used to be. Now the computers, even this laptop that I'm using to record these lectures on, is so far advanced compared to what computers were just 20 years ago. We can now go through and we can do large scale DNA sequencing. Honestly, it's too easy. There's too much. There's too much information. But what we're now trying to learn to do and do better is to go through and do these large scale sequencing. You know, it used to be really cool if you could sequence one gene. Or I remember uploading, you know, hey, look, I sequenced this part of a gene, maybe, you know, a few hundred nucleotides. You know, it's this gene, I think, and it's this part of it upload it, somebody else does another part, and somebody else has another part, and then finally somebody will publish the complete sequence and not as a paper, and it's because they took this part, that part, and this part, and this one overlapped, and they were able to link them all together. Nowadays, they go through and they can, you know, 
here's the you know short arm of chromosome four for this person, individual person. And there's so much information there that now they're trying to come up with better ways to compare. Yes, there's going to be differences on the short arm of chromosome four between me and you. But what differences in those DNA sequence, the AGCT sequence, means that I end up with cancer, you don't. I end up with something, you don't. You end up with some weird metabolic dysfunction that I don't. Which of the mutations, which of the changes is just the sheer fact that you come from a different lineage of Homo sapien than I do? That's the problem we're running into right now. And that's where uh, the big money now is going into computational biology. So anybody wants to make a lot of money, start, you know, learning computers.